once we dismiss, uh, I'll text you in the group and let you know when I'm headed back to Edwardsville if you want to meet uh, and receive communion on today. Amen? Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, I'm asking you to turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Amen. It was read this morning for your listening and hopefully for your application. Amen. But uh, I want to lift up uh, verses 12 through 14 and verses 20 through 25 in the gospel according to Mark. Amen. Mark chapter 11 verse 12 through 14 reads, On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, a fig tree that you curse has withered. Jesus said to him, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he, what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe, and you have received it, and it shall will be yours, and whatsoever, and whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against you, so that your Father also is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. Blessed is the word of Amen. the Lord. Amen. Amen. I struggle, I struggle about the subject, and I struggle about what to call this, amen, and what the Lord would have me to say, and the Spirit just said, cut off, All right. cut off. I don't know about you, but there are sometimes uh, some things in life that we just have to cut off. I, I, I'm a very family-oriented person, and I'm one of those type of people, when I love, I love hard, whether you're a friend or whether your family, amen. If I say I love you, then I'm going to exercise everything in my power to make sure you have what you need. I'll fight for you. My family, no, I literally will fight for you. If I, if you my family and I love you, I will fight for you. I almost ran a man down in a, uh, on the parking lot because he pushed my wife in the grocery store. Uh, so I will fight. I will fight for those that I love, amen. Amen. But it's a good fight. It's a fight that's Pleasure. worth fighting for. But sometimes in life, there's some things that we just have to cut off. Amen. 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 We have to cut it off because it is not good. It is not beneficial to us. There's some people we have to cut off. There's some situations that we need to cut off. There's some things that we just simply just need to cut off. And so while I was trying to figure it out, and I was going this and going this, and I'm like, Lord, what, what, what would you have me to say? What, what would you, you gave me the text, amen, and, but what would you say? And the Lord just said, cut off. Cut it off. Cut off your thinking sometimes. We got to cut that off. We got to cut off our thought process. We got to cut off our desires. We got to cut off our wishes. We got to cut off our wants. Because there's a blessing when you cut some things off. Mark records Jesus as he is passing by this fig tree. One thing I've learned in biblical studies is whatever it says, even if it's a small word, whatever the text says, it has meaning. And sometimes it's that little word, that obscure word that you're like, well, what is this here? You just may sometimes have you just pass over stuff. And sometimes when you go and you look at the significance of the smallest word you'll find. Jesus was hungry. We all get hungry. Jesus was 100% God in flesh. And so he was subject to the same feelings that we were. You know how you get when you're hungry. 
I know I, I don't know all of y'all. I know uh, quite a few of you, but I bet some of y'all is rather mean when you get hungry. <laughs> I bet some of y'all uh, uh, there, there's a term it, 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 they call it hangry. You, you get very you get kind of hangry because you're hungry, and, and your body desires is made to want to be fueled by food. Whatever you do, whatever you do to exert energy, you would replace you replace that energy with food. Now, some of us don't pick the right thing to replace it with. You know, our doctors are telling us, you know, get some carrot sticks and get some celery and and, 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 and eat a handful of nuts. And y'all know him. What a red hot ripple is that? Where 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 where, where the uh, hostess donuts? Uh, uh, you know what we you know we we all been there. You know when we go to the gas station, we want the cheese snaps and the butterfingers and the Snickers. We pass right by the healthy stuff because we're hungry. We want something to fill us. We want something to replace the energy that we have given out. And so now we need to replenish it. We're hungry. And so Jesus was hungry. And as, and as he was traveling, he, he noticed the fig tree. And it said something very important. He noticed that there were leaves on the fig tree. There were leaves on the fig tree. And because there were leaves on the fig tree, Jesus was assuming that there would be fruit on the fig tree. Because a, 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 a fig tree that did not bear fruit did not bear leaves either. So it gave the appearance of having fruit. I want to suggest to us, church, that we have been far too long giving the appearance. Well, Come on, somebody. We've been giving the appearance of having fruit. We've been given the appearance of being fruitful. We've been given the appearance of being healthy. But when the hungry come to be fed, we show just what little we have to offer. We wonder why our churches don't grow. Uh, we wonder why our ministries don't grow. We wonder why in our lives, our personal lives, we are not as prosperous as we are or want to be because we're given the appearance of being fruitful. But when those that are hungry come to us for nourishment, we have nothing to offer. I want to suggest to you, church, that if there's any indication of what we have experienced since March of 2020, we can no longer have the appearance of being fruitful. Because there's a world out there that's hungry. We found out just how hungry they were when the pandemic hit. People, healthy, just started dying, getting sick. People found out underlying health issues that they didn't even know they had would cause them to die. I know of more young, healthy people that didn't have anything wrong with them, contract COVID and die, but a 90-year-old woman in a nursing home gets it and survives. All right. All right. Yeah. No longer can we continue to appear to be fruitful, but we've got to actually produce what we are giving the appearance of having. Because church, what is happening is the world is hungry. How to reach the masses? Yeah, yeah. Those of every birth for an answer, Jesus gave the key. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw the world unto me. For the world is hungry for the living word. For an answer, Jesus gave the key. He said that if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Church, we've got to stop giving the appearance of being fruitful and actually be fruitful and start lifting up Jesus. Then and only then will we be able to truly be that, that, that city that sits out on the hill. Then and only then will we truly be the salt of the earth. Will we begin to show, not just to show, but actually possess what we're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. Because when we look at the text, we see 
that there is a price to pay for not being fruitful. Amen. Jesus looked at the tree and he said, no more, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. Jesus looked at that tree that gave the appearance of having fruit, gave the appearance of having sustenance for the hungry, gave the appearance of, of, of being able to restore those that, that, that were depleted. He looked at that tree and he said, no more will anyone be able to eat from you. Now, I, I think it, I, I'm, I'm a little strange. Sometimes I get to thinking, I said, now, okay, I, when I first started reading this, I said, oh, Jesus is kind of mean. You know, he was, yeah, he was hungry, but because the tree didn't have no fruit, he just said he cursed it. And then I got to thinking about that. Why did the fruit not have any tree? Now, why did the tree not have any fruit? It had leaves. So some fruit along the way had to be produced. I got to thinking, it's not in the text. I know sometimes it's okay to just deviate or just think a little bit. And so I think you began to paint certain scenarios. When you look at what fruit represents to us and, and, and how as believers we are called to be fruitful and we're called to, 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 to have uh, 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 what resources that those that encounter us will need. And so as believers we are to be fruitful and we are to be able to provide sustenance for the hungry. And you know sometimes we, we as fruitful as, as we try to be and as much as we try to do, how many know that sometimes we allow ourselves to be depleted by the wrong things and by the wrong people. And, and, and because we give ourselves and we do and we exercise uh, 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 everything that we can to help those that we that we love and those that we want to help, sometimes we allow our fruit to be depleted. I hear people say all the time, oh, I'll rest when I'm dead. All right. <laughs> well, you know what? You being dead does nobody any good. See, your death is not going to save anybody because you're not Jesus. Your death is not going to help anybody. So what you have to do is, is you have to work while it's there. You have to make sure that you are working to your full potential. And so that means sometimes you might have to step back. You might have to say, no, baby, I can't do it this time. Let me see if I can, I only got X amount, but let me see uh, uh, who else can help you with this. It's okay to be, a, I, I'm the biggest, greatest referral service you could ever find. Because there's some things I don't know how to do, and guess what, there's some things I just ain't going to do. One of the first things I did when my wife and I purchased our first house, we were walking out of uh, the, 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 the realtor's office. One of the first things I did was I called and got in the garden. Mm. Somebody was going to cut that grass because I wouldn't. <laughs> That's just one of them things I just ain't going to do, y'all. I'm sorry. I ain't going to do it. And so it's okay. That's not my ministry. That's not my place. And so what happens is, is we get depleted. We, we give everything and we have nothing for those that God is calling us for because we have given everything away. We gotta know our place. We gotta know what our ministry. We gotta know what our calling is. Because guess what? Somebody is gonna come along the way and they're gonna need something. And what's gonna happen? We're not gonna have anything to give them. Right. <coughs> Brothers, you've been out there dating and, and everything, and you come across a sister that you really, really like. She got everything that you've been looking for. And you get to talking to her, and all you can hear is all this baggage and stuff from the past and what uh, uh, Junebug did and what, what Johnny Ray did, what, you know, what everybody did to her. And here you are saying, I just want to take you to dinner. I just want to call you on the phone sometimes. And because everybody, she has been so nice and she has, she has bought folk this and that, and she's allowed uh, guys to use her car. I mean, just all kind of stuff. And because she's done all of that and she's so damaged and she's so, so hurt, she can't receive the gift that God has given her. Why? Because she allowed herself to be depleted. So we've got to learn. 
we got to learn and got to know where, when God has positioned us and when God has placed us and, and when God has destined us for something, we have a, a, a specific assignment to do. God has sent certain people for us. God has given us certain gifts and graces to profit the body of Christ. But we can't allow ourselves to continue to be depleted. Because what happens is that when it's time for us to shine, we have no light. When it's time for us to cook, we got nothing to cook with. When it's time to sing, we ain't got no voice no more because we used it up. When it's time to love, we can't love because we're so bitter. We got nothing but, but anger and hatred in our heart. Come on, somebody. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. It's time to forgive, but because you forgave and forgave and you allow people to continue to run over you and dog you out, now it's time to really truly forgive and you can't be. Why? Because you're depleted. Yeah. Mm. Right. There's lessons in our struggles. There's blessings in our burdens. Yes, it is. We just got to learn how to get that lesson how to get whatever it is that God is trying to teach us and show us and, 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 and use for, our, for, for his glory for us. But we've got to learn how to listen, pay attention. We've got to learn. Because what's going to happen is that there's going to be a time, there's going to be a day, there's going to be a situation where God is going to need us. We're nowhere to be found. I, I, this morning, I, I tell you how God works. And I laid everything out because I, I was like, y'all, we're leaving this house at 930. I laid everything out. That that I didn't lay out. I, I thought I knew exactly where it was. All right. And so I, even though I'm fully dressed, I'm kind of incomplete because there's a handkerchief and there's a, a lapel pin that goes with this. <laughs> this suit. And y'all know, y'all know me, y'all know I like to put my stuff together. And I, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. Had no idea, what I had just saw it, just put my hand on it, and I actually said, I'm gonna leave it there, because that way I'll know where it is on Sunday morning. Could not find it. See what happened? God has stuff for us to use at a certain time at a certain place, but we can't find it. God has an intended purpose for us. You, you know, uh, other denominations like to call themselves sanctified. Y'all do know what the word sanctified means. It means to be set apart for the use of God. God has sanctified you and sanctified your gifts. God has set you and your gifts apart for his use. But you can't go around here using up your gifts, using up what God has blessed you with for the purposes that God did intend for you to use them for. I'm a chef by profession. And I got an assignment one day. I worked at a Jewish nursing home. And I got an assignment one day to go into the kosher kitchen and cook. And you know, all that stuff that we read about in Leviticus and stuff like that, because they didn't accept Jesus, they still do all that stuff. And it's nerve-wracking. It's nerve-wracking to stand behind, a, to have me cooking, and you got a Jewish priest standing over your head. Right. See, I grew up old school. Get out of my way when I'm cooking. Don't look over my shoulder. Don't touch my posh. Don't, don't, don't do nothing. Get away from me when I'm cooking. But you got a Jewish rabbi standing over you. Is that kosher? What you think? And so you stay, so, so, and what I had to realize is they had everything marked because, you know, you go back to Levitical law and, you know, meat and some dairy and stuff couldn't mix. And so you had this color, this color pot and pan for this color side of the stove. It could not meet. It could not mix. And so what happened was I almost put a meat pot on the dairy side and he liked to have a fit. <laughs> But see what it was, whoever had used the kitchen before me didn't put the pot in the right place. And so because I was over in the meat pots getting ready to cook meat, somebody had put a dairy pot over in the meat pot and I didn't pay no attention so I'm just grabbing stuff. See when you are set aside 
and set apart for the use of God, you've got to be where he's put you. In order to be used by God, in order for, for your full gifts and graces to be used the way God has intended for you to use them, you've got to be where God has placed you. It's true. We're strategically placed in a spot where travelers would see it and want to be nourished, want to be fed. But because it bore no fruit, it could live out its intended purpose. I believe people talk about oh, this church isn't growing, and, or, or, or that we aren't growing, we aren't doing this. We are, we all AME, so we got the same struggle. Y'all just in Madison, we up in Edwardsville. We got the strange, same struggle. And, and one of the things that I have realized, and, and, and as much as I love all of the workshops and evangelism and church growth and development that we do, one thing I've realized is that it's up to you to know your surroundings. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to know the, er the area that you've been called to serve. And so when you know your area, you know how to prepare for ministry. If you was placed in a central location, and you don't know what type of uh, people could come to you for assistance or help. You kind of got to be a jack of all trades. You got to have a little sum of it all. And even if you can't provide the full strength of help, you should at least be able to tie them over, to get them to where they need to go. You can't have an urban ministry in a rural community. Come on now. Come on now. You can't have a prosperity movement in the midst of poverty. What? You got to know who you're called to serve. You got to know who you're called to minister to. So that when the hungry come, you'll have something for them. We see in our text that Jesus cursed the tree. He walked on. He left. He was officially done with that tree because he was hungry. If you go back and you read early in Mark, Jesus had just entered into Jerusalem. He was preparing to go the last stretch of his life. He had been healing some sick, raising some dead. He had done all of this, and then he knew what he had done, and he saw what was ahead of him. All right. And he was hungry. Mm -hmm. Church, these people out in the world have been to hell and back. Come on now. Come on. They've had to fight for everything they've ever had in life. Nothing was given to them. Gifts and graces that you just you are, are just able to enjoy because you are the blood bought believer of Jesus Christ. They don't realize that what they have, and so because they've had to struggle, because they've had to persevere, because they've had to endure, they've had to cry, they've had to yell, they've had to moan, they've had to fight for everything that they have and everything that they want, and so now they're coming. They just need some help. Amen, amen. They just need some help. But if you ain't got nothing, you can't give it to them. Jesus, well, that's why he cursed the tree. Because somebody went hungry. Somebody went without. Somebody didn't get the assistance that they need. Church, God is going to cut us off. God is going to cut us off as long as we continue to give the appearance of having fruit but have none. God is going to cut us off. And when God cuts us off, that's it. You don't believe me? Look around. There are churches all over that are closing their doors. And I'm not talking about just a and churches. See, we sometimes beat up on ourselves. We think that we're the only church struggling. 
We the only church that's got things going on in our administration that we don't, that's not good or we're not in favor of. Guess what some of the other ones do too? Them Bible thumping word that's believers right. delivering life. United fellowships, they have the same problems that you have. But we thought because they're not mainstream, oh, it's all good over here. They got the same problems. But what God is saying is that when your problems and your issues become bigger than me, the God that you are supposed to be serving, I'm going to have to cut you off. Come on now. Why? Because you're not, you're not shining light in darkness. You're not providing water to the thirsty. You're not providing food for the hungry. You're not providing clothing to the naked. You're not providing rest for the weary. Come on. And when you are not doing what I have called for you to do, I'm going to have to cut you off. And church, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be cut off from God. I don't want Jesus to take his hand off of me. Because I can only imagine that if Jesus were to take his hand off of me, if Jesus were to say, I'm done with you, no more. It's, that's it. Nothing else is going to come from you. I can only imagine what it would be like to be void and empty, lifeless, in darkness, suffering. We got to realize that because God has called us for a time such as this, God has called us to, do, to save, to preach to a dying world his salvation, to yes. preach to a dying world that, yeah, you might have been knocked upside your head. Yeah, you might have been cursed. You might have been, been, been hurt. But guess what? If you take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burdens are like if you cast your cares upon me I'm able to remove all the doubt and the fear I'm able to love you like nobody else has loved you, I'm able to comfort you like nobody else has comforted you I'm able to heal you when the doctor shake their head and say we've done all we can do but Jesus is saying I am the resurrection I am the blood of them. I shed my blood for them so they are not Trust me. Ooh, yes, yes. And when we trust God, we know that God isn't going to cut us off. God isn't going to just say, I'm done with you. But there's life in Christ. There's life in Christ. We may not look it, we may not represent it, but guess what? If you are in Jesus Christ, you have life. Yes, yes. That's the reason why he says that I'm going to conquer death and sin. Mm -hmm. Because there's no life in sin and law. He said that I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Yes. Yes. See, when we cut some things off, when we cut off some situations, we cut off some people, some places, and some things. Then and only then can we truly, truly experience life. And as I take my seat, I want to, uh, anybody here doing gardening? We got any gardeners in the house. That's not something I'm going to do. It ain't my ministry. But I did uh, uh, do a little research on it. And in order for something to be fruitful, in order for it to grow, in order for it to produce the, 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 the leaf and, or the flower or whatever it is that it's supposed to produce, sometimes the gardener has to do something called pruning. Yes. Amen. Sometimes the gardener has to take and prune some things off of it. And, and, and what I've noticed is the few times that I've done it, when you prune something, uh, uh, or when you prune something, you take away something from it. Sometimes the things are dead. Sometimes it's dead leaves and, and dead foliage. There's sometimes things that are dead that, that is just getting in the way yes. of yes. the plant. It, it, it's stopping, the, it, it's, in, it, it's, in, it's enabling the plant, it's keeping the plant to, uh, from getting the nutrients that yes. it needs to get in order to grow. 
And so what happens is that sometimes when you, uh, I, I did it with a house plant, and I noticed that there was a bunch of dead stuff and dead vines and stuff in the bottom. And, and so the plant began to die because the dead uh, foliage was keeping the plant from the water. Church, we got some dead folk and some dead stuff yes. that's killing us. Yes. We got yes. some dead traditions yes. and some yes. dead thoughts and some dead ways. We got some dead living that, that's keeping us from being fruitful. Yes. And so God is saying it's time to cut it off. Yes. It's time to cut it out. It's time to get rid of it. Why? Because it's keeping you mm -hmm. from growing. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All right. We got to prove away the dead stuff. But, you know, that's kind of easy to do. Because dead stuff has a dead look about it. It's got a dead feel. It's got a dead attitude. So it's easy when you're pruning something. Oh, it's dry. It's cracked. It's brown. It, 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 it has no life. It, we can get rid of it. But what I found in pruning is sometimes you get those tricky weeds. See, those weeds have been hanging around the plant, sucking up just as much water and sunshine as that plant. Yes. They've been hanging around the plant, and they, they've been rooting, getting deeply rooted into the plant, and, and going where the water is, going where the sun is, because they know that that plant got something good, and, and they, they, they want to get to it, and so they want to suck it up. Church, we got some weeds in our midst. Yes. We got some folk that all they want to do is get up under the roof and suck up the, the, the blessings, suck up the promise, suck up the goodness that Jesus is offering. They have no intentions on doing anything with it but just cutting us off and killing and destroying us. We got to prune up those weeds. Why? Because those weeds are what keeping us from growing. Those weeds are what sucking up the good blessings that God has given us. It's the weeds that sucking up the water, sucking up the sunlight, sucking up the air. And we allow the weeds to keep growing. And because they appear like us, they, they get just as green as us. They're just as uh, uh, young as us. They're just as mature as us. And so we allow the weeds to keep growing and sucking up everything up. But God is saying, no, you got to watch those weeds because they may look like the plant, but they're not the plant. Yes. So it's got to be cut off. Thank you. Thank you. We got to cut those things off because they're not what God wants for us. They're not what God wants for us. God is saying, I got so much for you. I got work for you to do. I tell Wesley Chapel that all the time. Remember that song the Isley Brothers came out with? And Vanessa Williams came out and remade it? I got work to do. There's so much work for us to do. But as long as we are bogged down with weeds and death stuff and, and things that don't really matter, we cannot provide the nourishment. We can provide the sustenance. We can provide the life that God has wanted us to provide to those that are dying. Amen. Amen. See, we think God has given us all this for us. We think, oh yeah, God loves me so much, he saved me just so I can go to heaven. Yeah, he did. But he also put clapping in your hands mm -hmm. so that you could praise him. Oh, yeah. He also put victory in your voice so you can raise it and glorify him. Amen. He also gave you a testimony mm -hmm. so you can share to the lost and let them know that it's Jesus Christ that died for your sin. It's Jesus Christ that saved you when you were fit to live, when you were out there doing your thing, and you was going to the club, and you was smoking them blunts, and you was drinking that fifth, and whatever it was you was doing, stuff you didn't have no business. Oh, y'all don't look at me like that. Y'all ain't been saved y'all whole life. Between Brooklyn and East St. Louis, y'all ain't been saved y'all whole life. Y'all done done some stuff. I done done some stuff. I done been some places, but thanks be unto God that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross and took on my sins and, and my shame and, and my sickness and my diseases and my habits so that I would not have to die in them. I would encourage you, my brothers 
and my sisters, if you are here today, if you yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to encourage you. Don't put it off any longer. Amen. I want to encourage you, my brothers and my sisters, that if you found yourself seeking something and wanting something, the fruit is on the tree. All you have to do is just reach up and grab it. If you need to rededicate your life to God, maybe you, along the way, you ate the fruit, you kept going, and going and going, and now it's time to eat some more. I want to encourage you, it's okay. The Bible tells us not to be weary and well-doing, but he's promised to be rest to the weary. And if you need a church home, I encourage you, don't continue, don't continue to bounce back and forth. Don't continue to go without covering. Why? There's work for you to do. And so when you cut some stuff off, guess what? When your soul has been anchored and you have a place of worship and a place that you can be taught, a place where you can be nurtured and matured. When you cut some stuff off, you'll learn how to replace them with the stuff that God wants you to have. All right, All right, you'll get strength for the journey. You'll be able to carry on. Why? Because you're anchored. You're not blowing to and fro. But God has planted you. So I encourage you. If any one of those three appeals fits you or fits your needs, the doors of the church are open. Amen. Let us stand.
in a season where people are scared to come to church because of a pandemic. They don't have a man. They just, just oh, I can get right on in. And guess what? If he comes in, it's nobody's fault but yours. Don't allow it. Don't allow him in. And if you don't allow him in, God will preserve you and he will restore you. And it'll be like this time never happened. Amen? Amen. 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 Give God some praise.